Hello and welcome to the first season of the Journalism Salute. I'm Mark Simon, based in a Lehigh Valley part of Pennsylvania. I'm a 1997 graduate of the College of New Jersey with a journalism degree who has worked in sports media for 25 years. For the last three months, I have been sending daily journalism salutes on social media, pairing them with donations to a wide range of journalistic organizations. My intent was to counter cries of fake news, lamestream media, and enemy of the people by doing a little of whatever I could each day to help. The next phase of this project is to learn more about the groups that I've been saluting. That's where these interviews come in. Who are these groups? What do they do? What do they do best? And why are they so important to our present and our future? We'll talk to people from a diverse set of organizations to try to learn more. Thank you for joining me. On today's podcast, we're joined by Allison Augustine, the Executive Director of Investigate West. Investigate West is a nonprofit headquartered in Seattle, Washington, doing watchdog journalism in the Pacific Northwest, focusing on original reporting in the areas of public health, the environment, and government accountability. It was founded in 2009 and partners with many different groups across the region that support public service journalism. Allison has experience in both nonprofit consulting and journalism and is the author of a book about the history of gemstones. Thank you for joining us. And my first question would just be, what role does Investigate West fill in the journalistic ecosphere? Um, so basically, investigative journalism and explanatory journalism, which are two heads of the same coin, is going away because newsrooms are getting cut across the United States and investigative and explanatory stories and explanatory is simply what it says. It's, it explains a big, long, complicated process into ways that general public might want to engage with it. Um, these stories take a long time and generally don't drop with any sort of regularity. If you're going to follow an investigation, you kind of don't know necessarily where the story is going to take you or who might talk to you or what data you might dig up along the way. So, you might investigate something that you think is going to maybe publish in four months. Maybe it turns out to be a year. So this is a tricky part of journalism that's really necessary and it has critical impact on society. Like investigative and explanatory stories can have huge societal impact. And actually, there are economists who have put forth data that shows that for every dollar spent on investigative reporting, it yields like $125 in societal good. It's just that it takes a lot of time and money up front before you get that payoff. So one of the first places that newsrooms cut when they're looking at what's expensive and what doesn't have immediate turnaround, it's investigative and explanatory reporting. So the fact that we exist as a nonprofit specifically to do that kind of reporting is really critical because we're one of the few outlets doing that in the Pacific Northwest and that extends up into BC as well. Now I go to INVW.org and I can see a selection of the stories you've done, but as you said, you're not a traditional outlet in that you're not writing every day. Uh, so explain how the group works in terms of writers, editors, staff, and, uh, and how you're organized. Well, basically, for a long time, it was just our executive editor, who's also one of the founders, um, some three journalists from the Seattle PI, a well-respected paper out here in Seattle, we're really worried about investigative reporting going away. So they got together and founded this nonprofit in 2009. So basically along the way, staff has changed, the model has changed, journalism itself has changed. So what they did was brought me in as an executive director to help form the strategy and look at funding models, which is really an issue now. So the executive editor and I get together and we go, okay, what's gonna meet the strategy for the organization? Um, not just fundraising, but also journalism and ethically, what's going to work. And then the executive editor already has an eye on stories, has a tickler file of things that he's been following, that people have been sending to us via the tip line, et cetera. And then we work with a stable of freelance journalists and photojournalists, data visual artists, graphic artists, et cetera, that we hire for each project. So we do contract letters along the way. And Right now, we have an upcoming series that we're working on launching in the fall about decarbonizing the Pacific Northwest. And we have contracted long term with a very, very good senior editor, reporter named Peter Fairley, who's an expert in this area. So now for that story series, it will be me, our editor, Robert, and then Peter working on the shape of these stories. 
also working with other consultants like we're going to bring in um, our sensitivity readers, DEI readers. We have community engagement people who inform. We have a storyteller who does narrative specifically who will help us shape the story so that it's not just purely scientific. And then we will contract out with the writers who need to do the on the ground work in the different regions that we're focusing on. So Washington, Oregon, and BC right now. We're also hiring two interns that will help through the life of this project so that they'll get training because there are not a lot of training rooms left for people and we want to help support younger journalists give them a platform so it's complicated because it's a variety of different strategies coming together but if you wanted to make it the most simple it would be editor senior editor and then reporters and everybody just fans out and brings it all back in within the mission of what the group is trying to do is there is it i presume it's a qua a quality over quantity kind of uh <laughs> approach in that you don't necessarily say we're going to do 12 15 stories this year uh you're looking for for impact you measure by impact i presume yes we do both i mean right now to date in 2020 i think we released 35 stories um 2019 it was over 50 so we're actually publishing on average, you know, one a week. It's just that, it, you know, some weeks, weeks might have more stories than others. But um, so we definitely want to get information out there because there are a lot of stories that people aren't covering. And those are the stories that we're looking for. What isn't being covered? What's really important? Or what can we cover from a different angle that's really important to people? So it's a question of just getting information out to people, but yes, also circling back and going, what is the impact of these stories? And sometimes it's very easy to tell. There's some really basic metrics that everybody uses, like how many people saw the stories? You know, you can track it with how many page hits you get. How much social media reach did it have? That's a little more spongy, but also a metric people use. But right now, what we're doing in the organization is also defining what impact looks like to us, which is a common problem across journalism, because you can talk about, okay, we changed legislation, which we have done. We've changed legislation in Washington state um, with our foster care series. Nine laws have been changed as a result. So many more dollars have gone into funding foster care because of the problems inherent in the system that we've identified. So that's pretty much direct impact, but also direct impact is what happens to an individual person who's in the foster care system? What happens to that kid? And does anything that we've reported on with them end up helping them? That's another way to measure impact. So there are a lot of newsrooms that are doing that right now is, you know, you're doing a lot of storytelling for people. What can we do beyond just numbers to measure the impact on people? And a lot of it is just doing more interviews and checking back in and making sure people are doing well as a result of our reporting. If you look at the uh, history of the group, you can find plenty of examples of their stories online, uh, both in written form and podcasts. I was recently listening to one uh, about concussions uh, and high school athletes that was particularly interesting. But I want to look at a couple of uh, print ones that you've done recently. This was fascinating to me. I read uh, one of the investigative works that you did on tree cutting. Uh, uh -huh. This got brought up by a singer at a local council meeting to show you the, I guess, the locality of the story. And then gradually it gets bigger and bigger and there's a social justice component to it. Trees are being cut down to make way for apartment developments in places like Seattle, which are among the largest growing cities in the country. There's a lot of bureaucracy. Uh, nine groups are in charge of uh, dealing with trees. And I'll read a, a brief uh, excerpt. That's the social justice piece that could give tree protection more diverse support in 2020. This summer, South Seattle will be baking in stark sunlight with only about 11% tree canopy in neighborhoods like South Park with roughly 35% canopy cover, leafy North End neighborhoods will have it made in the shade. And we aren't just talking about heat, but about health. Asthma in the Duwamish Valley, including childhood asthma, is much worse than the city's overall asthma rate in part because residents in South Seattle, many of them poor, are exposed to diesel fuel pollution and there aren't many trees to intercept that soot, suck up carbon dioxide and push out oxygen. Can you tell us more about that story? Sure, I mean, this is a good example of making connections for people who may not otherwise understand the connections. So I think in a rough sense, people understand that trees are good for the environment. 
they may not realize the extent to which trees are good for the environment and the extent to which old trees are good for the environment. So you can't just cut down, you know, a 200 year old tree in Seattle and replace it with some ornamental, say dogwood or something and expect it to do the same job. A lot of this region um, is logged, but then there's also great, great swaths that are untouched and including in the city. And as those um, resources go away, the air gets more polluted. There's more um, heat sink within the cement and the cities. There's all kinds of things that happen when you cut down big trees and reduce the canopy. And it's not just impacting our city or our state, it's impacting other states as well. It's all connected, right? So you start by, you know, talking about the woman who sang the song. Um, she was a member of this amazing Seattle punk band called The Enemy. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so it makes sense for her to have sung something, you know, and, um, you know, her song really got the city council's attention. And we'd worked with her and talked with her because she's a huge advocate for the trees in the throughout the whole city. And then her video of it went viral and has garnered like 800,000 views already um, because people both like wanted to engage with a story like this in a way that's different, like a song. They wanted to see reaction from public officials and get their attention in a way that they might actually do something about it. And they like understanding that, hey, this is all connected and actually it does matter when somebody cuts down a tree for an apartment building. What is the city that we wanna look like and what is the environment that we wanna build for, our, for ourselves and but more importantly for future generations. So. You know, that's a story that wouldn't normally probably get covered apart from, you know, maybe if another paper did it as like a, you know, community kind of fluff piece is like, hey, this woman sang at the council. But actually what she did was really important and got their attention. And a couple of the council members have said they're going to look at creating stronger tree protection legislation in 2020. Now, we'll follow up on that story and see if it actually happens. But at least we know that we got their attention and that we've gotten the general public's attention. And so our reach on that story has been significant and people want to know what's going to happen next. You mentioned something that the singing and that it, it kind of uh, spiraled uh, is viral video. Um, that's new. When I was in school, you know, 1995, <laughs> 1996, 1997, that sort of thing didn't exist. Uh, how closely does your group pay attention to things of that sort uh, in order to try to come up with ideas? Well, that's a great question because that's kind of the question that all journalism is talking about now, not just nationally, but globally. Um, integrating media with print. And journalism is traditionally a slower field to adopt new technologies. That's changing quite rapidly now. People are starting to figure out that, hey, hello, you know, a lot of people are online, you know, a lot of people are into a lot of different places. People want to see videos, they want to hear things. Um, we're talking about a virtual reality initiative right now to talk about environment, to envision what a future globe could look like if we don't take action now. I mean, there's a lot of tools at our disposal and there's no reason that we can't use all of them. And when there's areas that I don't recognize as well or I don't know as much about. For example, I took a podcasting class myself, ironically enough, since I'm on this, and learned a ton about just how you craft a story through audio that goes beyond like the old radio dramas that introduces sound elements. Uh, podcasting allows people to listen while they're doing something else. So you have to try tactics to get people's attention. Everybody's using all of their senses all the time. And if you want to get a story out there and compete with all the other information that's out there, not just journalism, but just pure information, you have to meet people where they live. That only makes sense. And especially younger generations, if we want to encourage younger people to read or get engaged in news groups and journalism on their own terms, we have to meet them there on their own terms. So yes, it absolutely is informing our strategy of what we're doing going forward. And with that in mind, how does a story with your group go from beginning to completion? You know, I came onto this organization four months ago and I've been an avid reader of, the, of Investigate West before that. And I often wondered that question myself. And so what we're doing now is experimenting with what that model looks like. And the best example I can give you is in this anchor year long series that we're doing on decarbonization that I mentioned, which is how to actually take greenhouse gases out of the environment and what we can see by 2030 to meet global environmental goals 
local environmental goals, and then actually take out the majority of greenhouse gases by 2050 to actually have an impact. Okay, so the way that's working right now is it's, you know, originally it was just a concept between me and our executive editor, Robert McClure. And then we were like, okay, well, who do we actually need to help us understand the science and do the strong scientific reporting of this? And then luckily we knew Peter Fairley, who's an excellent writer and amazing um, scientific writer. And he agreed to come on for the length of this project. And so then we're like, okay, well, we've got our science, we've got our editorial ideas, we're identifying areas that we would like to focus on, such as equity, because like you just mentioned in the South Side story about the tree cutting, you know, the Duwamish people are affected in a very different way than rich white people on the North Side of Seattle are affected. And that same thing is true across all issues of climate change and environmental impact. So we really want to focus the story series on how are people and marginalized communities in particular disproportionately affected because of economy, because of location, et cetera. So knowing that, what are the stories we can craft around that? And that's a discussion that we shouldn't just have on our own. We're three white people. We want to bring in, we have a sensitivity reader and DEI consultant, diversity, equity, inclusion consultant that is going to advise us. And we want to bring in community engagement before we even embark on those stories. So we're going to do a series of outreach and interviews and paid consultants, et cetera. So it's really about identifying who we have in-house, broadening who we have in-house, and that's leadership. So we need to hire new people, um, diverse people, BIPOC people. We need that at a board level as well, our leadership, to have that um, conversation in-house. And then we need to bring it to the community so that we're writing for community with community, you know, nothing without community. Um, we're not reporting on people, we're reporting with people on stories that matter to them. So it's a kind of a newer model because in the old days, journalism used to just be, hey, there's a story, I'm reporting on it. And now it's much, much more collaborative. And that shift is really critical, especially given the times that we're living in now with COVID where we're all siloed. And especially, especially with the current Black Lives Matter civil rights movement that's happening. Like we just, we should never have been ignoring it, but we really can't ignore it now. I was listening to a podcast with Ezra, Ezra Klein of Vox and Margaret Sullivan of the Washington Post recently, and Ezra brought up something that you brought up at the start of the interview, uh, that websites that focus on investigative journalism do great work, but that the public demand isn't necessarily there. Now, you, your group has been around for 11 uh, years, so clearly there's, there's a successful history there. Uh, what would you say to counter what he said? I think it's that it's the way in which investigative reporting is reported. It's very much to your point about what media is used. So obviously I'm a huge fan of both Ezra Klein and Margaret Sullivan. I think their podcast is great and it's really important what they're reporting on, but it's only, investigative reporting is only not getting its due because it's not been up to speed with modern times. We just need to modernize it. We need to, again, meet people where they are with technology. And also we have seen that once people come on um, and they read the stories, the reaction is huge and impactful. And we see that in the way people fund us. We see that in the way people circulate our stories. We see that in personal uh, emails that come through to us that say, hey, thank you so much. You wouldn't believe this happened to me or this happened to a family friend or this story helped us understand better our own situation. So I think our job as an investigative nonprofit newsroom now is to make sure that we're meeting the readership slash audiences, not everybody's reading, right? Where they live so that we're disseminating the news in the most broad way possible. And that includes working with other media partners. And then also making sure that we're really clear on the impact so that when people understand that, hey, I'm reading a long form story or I'm listening or I'm engaging with it interactively, some data visualization, that the outcomes are going to be there. So I think Ezra's right in that maybe people don't fully understand it. Investigate West has its job ahead and that we need to, you know, make sure we're up to date on technology. We need to educate people. There's a big educational component about the work we do. We need to rebuild trust with the audiences. I mean, trust is at an all time low between American readers and media and to build that trust, I think it's that we show the impact and we show that we really are out here trying to make the world a better place. 
and um, here are some ways that we can do it. Short term and long term, uh, the future of your group. You have a story upcoming in the Atlantic. Can you tell us about that? Sure. Um, this week we'll have a story called Who Killed the Supergrid? which is basically a story about how there are two major energy grids that are on the west side of the nation and on the east side of the nation. And then there's a big geographical rift in between them. And if we could get those two grids talking to each other, we could really boost a lot of energy power, taking away our reliance on the coal industry. Um, but it's a question of, you know, physically overcoming this gap that exists and then also maintenance of that gap. And it would take huge government buy-in to do that. And as you might imagine, not to tip my hand here, but the Trump administ administration is not, they're more interested in funding coal than they are in finding renewable energy sources. And this is that story about how people started proposing this idea of, hey, we can get people free energy we, by boosting the signal and we were thwarted because of an of a government that doesn't want us to do that so it really shows the craziness of the politics behind this stuff that actually we could really get ahead and make environmental progress but politics are as much of that story as technology is so it's really important that people not only stand, understand the technology of how these things can physically work but also the politicians who could both help and hinder that progress. And so then you have citizens who understand the issue and can make informed decisions and votes based on that. So that's why that story has been so wonderful to work on with The Atlantic. They've been great to work with and um, will come out soon. And hopefully a lot of people will see that and understand even a little bit better to Ezra's point, how investigative reporting or explanatory reporting can really help people make significant change. And I think that's the goal for the organization, certainly uh, in the long-term future. Uh, all right, the last part of my show, pay it forward. What advice do you have for aspiring journalists when it comes to investigative work? And what journalism organizations would you like to salute? So for aspiring investigative journalists, I think you've got to get your hands on everything. I think you've got to read everything. Anyone who wants to write, you have to read everything all the time. And read broadly, read outside of your reach, outside of your comfort zone. People are doing a lot of different things with narrative, but also with structure and form that might inform your work. And then get some real world experience with it. Take internships, try to find people who will mentor you, read a book about investigative reporting. We've got a great board member named Brant Houston who just released his uh, you know, seventh edition, I think it is, of the Investigative Reporter's Handbook. That thing is broadly read. Um, and then I would salute a local group we have here called the South Seattle Emerald, which is not an investigative group, but is an excellent Southside community paper that is really engaged with the community, talking about issues that matter to the people, and then working with other groups. Like us, we have partnered on stories um, to share the distribution to make sure that everybody is getting access to information in an equitable way. So they're doing great work and I'm really pleased that we've been able to work with them in the past and then hopefully more in the future. It sounds like your organization is doing great work as well. Uh, Allison, thank you for taking the time to join us. Oh, well, Mark, thanks so much. This is so great. And as I've said in the past, I'm really heartened by people who care about this because it's critical to democracy. So thank you for inviting me and talking about it. There were a lot of good takeaways from my conversation with Allison. Whether it's reporting on local issues like the planting of trees or bigger, broader issues like making the best use of power grids, investigative reporting is extremely important. And there's plenty more great investigative work still to be done across the country and around the world. For more information on Investigate West, go to invw.org. I recommend the Journalism with Impact section of their homepage for more information on the things that Allison talked about. The Journalism Salute is dedicated to the memory of Dr. Robert Cole, known as Father of Journalism at Trenton State College, the College of New Jersey. Dr. Cole impacted hundreds of students in his 33 years at the school, including some who later became investigative reporters. Thank you for listening to the Journalism Salute. If you like this episode, please subscribe, rate, and review, and let us know what you think. If you're interested in following along with us, follow us on Twitter at Journalism Salute. Salute, S-A-L-U-T, 
with no E. Thank you for tuning in.